Hello, I'm Bob Tyler. I've been a real estate lawyer in Winnipeg for 30 years. I've been a partner in one of the largest law firms in Manitoba. But previous to that, I, like yourselves, was a registrant under the Real Estate Brokers Act. I've kept current over the years with the regulation of the real estate industry in Manitoba. And I'm here to speak with you today about some of the changes that you can expect with the implementation of the new Real Estate Services Act. The Real Estate Brokers Act will be repealed on January 1st of 2022 and replaced by the Real Estate Services Act. Manitoba Securities Commission is authorized by the Real Estate Services Act to enact regulations respecting many matters that will assist in regulating the real estate industry in Manitoba. An ancillary regulation to this new act will also be enacted on January 1st. In this presentation, I'll be reviewing important aspects of each of these. I will refer to the Real Estate Services Act as RESA, and I will refer to the ancillary regulation simply as the regulation. And I will refer to the soon to be repealed Real Estate Brokers Act and soon to be repealed current regulations as the former regime. A handbook for this presentation is available for all registrants, and I'll be referring to some of the specific pages throughout this presentation. And if you've not already received or made a print copy of the handbook, please access the handbook at this link so that you are able to refer to it and make notes during the presentation. Knowledge of RISA and the regulation is essential to every registrant engaged in providing real estate services in Manitoba. Now links to both RISA and the regulation are found on the last page of the handbook. I recommend you access these two important documents today, bookmark them so that you can refer to them whenever issues arise that need to be considered to ensure that you're in compliance with RISA and the regulations. Now I can say this, many of the requirements contained in the former regime have been carried over into RISA and into the regulation and remain relatively the same. But there are some important differences. And in this presentation, I'll be discussing the important new requirements under RISA. It's important that you take the time and focus for the next few minutes as I walk through the legislative changes. I will also review some of the important equivalent requirements under the former regime, particularly those that have been expanded upon. So if you look at page six of your handbook, you'll see that I'll be discussing 12 different topics. The first item relates to revised and expanded registration categories. A publicly accessible register will be made available by the Manitoba Securities Commission setting out registration information about each registrant. A registrant's ongoing registration will be conditional on the registrant complying with RISA and the regulation. All existing registration as at December 31, 2021 will transition from the former regime to RISA effective January 1, 2022. Re-registration will not be required. There is, however, one change in a registration category that will affect those who are licensed as authorized officials, but who are not currently registered as either the Manitoba representative of the brokerage or appointed as the manager of the branch office. Now, these individuals will have their registrations transitioned from authorized official to real estate salesperson. The Manitoba Securities Commission is expected to issue guidance to those affected by this transition, outlining how they may qualify to register as a real estate broker or associate broker should they need to manage a brokerage in the future. Now, the second topic is about personal real estate corporations. You'll see the outline for the requirements for setting up a personal real estate corporation. Any registrant may now incorporate a personal real estate corporation to provide services on behalf of their brokerage. A registrant must obtain the consent of the brokerage before applying for this registration. If the brokerage consents, 
then two registrations will be required, one for the individual registrant and a second for their personal real estate corporation. Now, having a personal real estate corporation is not a requirement, it's not necessary, and it may not be advantageous. Legal and accounting advice is recommended before you consider registering a personal real estate corporation. The third topic I wish to speak about is expanded professional standards. Each registrant is required under RISA to demonstrate skill, honesty, and integrity in providing real estate services. Now under RISA, new conduct standards have been established and are required of all registrants. There are some new terms, professional misconduct, conduct unbecoming, deceptive dealing, wrongful taking. You should read and understand these terms because it's important that you comply with the requirements. Professional misconduct now includes, in its definition, a demonstration of incompetence in performing any activity for which a registration under RISA is required. Conduct unbecoming refers to any conduct that's considered contrary to the best interests of the public or which may undermine public confidence in the real estate industry or which may bring the real estate industry into disrepute. Now, the offending action does not have to take place while a registrant is working in a capacity related to real estate services. By example, a registrant who posts an offensive or unprofessional social media post or video may be committing conduct unbecoming of a registrant if the public is exposed to the post and connects its messaging with you as the registrant. RISA also prohibits a registrant from inducing any person to breach a contract. Contracts such as an offer to purchase contract, an offer to lease, or a service agreement. And as mentioned earlier, a registrant's ongoing registration will be conditional on the registrant complying with RISA and the regulation. Now, failure to comply can result in penalties as high as $100,000 for registrants in a salesperson capacity. These numbers previously were in the $2,000, $4,000 and $10,000 range. They're much higher today. The Manitoba Securities Commission may issue orders against a registrant to pay penalties as well as investigative and hearing costs, which could be over and above those amounts. Even if a registrant surrenders their registration or has had their registration suspended or revoked, any complaints, any investigations, any actions against a former registrant can still occur. The fourth topic is the expanded authority of the Manitoba Securities Commission and the Registrar. Expanded authority is granted to the Registrar to investigate and to act. And this includes the authority for the Registrar or uh, the investigating staff at the Manitoba Securities Commission to enter into the premises of a brokerage to conduct an investigation. Publication of any final disciplinary decisions against a registrant are required to be posted online by the Manitoba Securities Commission. A registrant's registration category and related information is also to be organized at the Manitoba Securities Commission so it is searchable online by the registrant's name. Item number five is broker management and registrant supervision. Although this part of the presentation is directed to registrants who are registered in a salesperson registration category, that is registrants who are not managing an office. I wanna mention some of the more important duties imposed on brokers and managers so that everyone is aware of the important roles that they must play under RISA. There are increased responsibilities for managing registrants under RISA. 
The managing registrant is defined in the regulation as the person registered to manage your brokerage. Managing registrants are responsible for control, the conduct of all of the brokerage's real estate services. And managing registrants must supervise all salespeople, other brokers, managers, etc. Managing registrants are responsible to ensure that copies of every offer, every service agreement is promptly filed with the brokerage. And managing registrants are responsible for all of the trust account compliance rules and requirements, including the timing when deposits must be received and deposited. Topic number six is offer to purchase lease content requirements. As in the former regime, every offer, every counter offer, every acceptance must be made in writing and contain all of the terms, conditions, and information required by the legislation before it is signed. And once signed, prompt communication and delivery of each offer is required of each counter offer and each acceptance. Required offer to purchase or offer to lease content includes the following and more. Dates the contract was made, the names of the parties, the addresses of the parties, civic or legal descriptions of the property, the method of the payment of deposit, if any, and whether it is to be included in the purchase price, details on possession, details on occupancy, details on adjustments for such things as taxes, utilities, etc. Please refer to page 42 and 43 of the handbook for the details about the required content. There are 11 items in section 4.3 and 4.4 of the regulation. And this is very important. Make a note, any failure to include any one of the 11 items required by the regulation will disentitle the brokerage and the registrant to remuneration. Now, under the former regime, remuneration was also affected, but it was if the registrant was acting in bad faith, only then. But under the new regulation, bad faith does not have to be proven. Remuneration will be affected by error or omission. The prior statutory offer to purchase form for single family residential properties and for residential condominium properties and the statutory form for the property disclosure statement for residential properties has been carried over to the RISA and regulation with the exception of a few minor terminology changes in the two offer to purchase forms. The property disclosure statement form remains the same. Now the changes in the two statutory offer to purchase forms are somewhat insignificant, but everyone should be aware of them because new updated offer to purchase forms are to be used beginning January 1st, 2022, containing these changes. Now the changes include such things as broker will now be referred to as brokerage, Selling broker will now be referred to as the buyer's brokerage and selling salesperson will now be referred to as the buyer's salesperson. But look at the forms you're using after December 31st to see that they contain reference to being prescribed under the Real Estate Services Act and not under the Real Estate Brokers Act as is stated in the current forms to ensure that you are using the correct forms. So as of January 1st, the use of the current forms for residential and condominiums must be discontinued. If a registrant is providing services through a personal real estate corporation, which I spoke about earlier, a statement setting out the name of the personal real estate corporation must be inserted in every offer to purchase or lease. So that's something to keep in mind. Number seven self-dealing and related party disclosure. These requirements are practically unchanged from the previous regime. But do look at page 45 of the handbook because there are some changes. Whenever a registrant buys, sells, rents, 
or leases, written disclosure is required and that disclosure must state that they are a registrant under the Real Estate Services Act and that no remuneration is payable and it must also state the nature and extent of the registrant's interest in the trade. Registrants must make the written disclosure as soon as practical and then again it must be repeated in every offer to purchase or lease. Registrants must notify the brokerage before engaging in the trade on their own behalf and they must have any advertising pre-approved before they advertise, which would apply when they are typically selling or leasing property. And they must provide the brokerage with a list of information about the transaction that is required as set out in the regulation. So please have a look at page 50 and 51 of the handbook, which sets out the disclosure requirements specified in section 4 Point one three of the regulation and as I had said before it's pretty much of a carryover not too much has changed what has changed is what it means to be related for disclosure purposes related means your spouse or common-law partner your children or stepchildren parents or step parents siblings and step-siblings and includes any corporations or firms that the registrant or that these family members have a material interest in or the directors or officers of such corporations or firms. Now if the related person is a spouse or common-law partner or a child the disclosure must state that no remuneration is payable. The disclosure must be made in writing as soon as practical and it must be repeated in every offer. And these requirements are practically unchanged as I'd mentioned before. A registrant is disentitled to remuneration if the trade involves a registrant or their spouse or their common law partner. Now that's the same as under the former regime, but the disentitlement has now been expanded to include any child of the registrant. And as in the former regime, related parties include any corporation or firm that the registrant, their spouse or common law partner, or now child has a material interest in or the directors or officers of such corporation or firm. Number nine, electronic signatures. Any agreement prescribed by or required by RISA, such as offer to purchase, offer to lease, service agreements, sellers, buyers, with landlords, with tenants, any agreement, any amendment, any notices to those agreements may now be signed electronically and executed and transmitted pursuant to the Electronic Commerce and Information Act. The Electronic Commerce and Information Act is a Manitoba law of general application and in it, part three enables the use of digital signatures provided that the conditions outlined are met unless the parties to the transaction agree otherwise. Now a link to the Electronic Commerce and Information Act can be found on the last page of the handbook. Registrants should read and become familiar with part three of this act if they intend to utilize electronic signatures. Number 10, advertising. There are some important new requirements regarding advertising. Advertising includes publications and other mediums such as business cards, websites, social media, direct mail, benches, billboards, outdoor signs, etc. The name of the brokerage must be identified in all advertising and the name of any individual whose image is depicted in any advertising must be identified in the advertisement. The owner of the property, the seller or the landlord, must consent when property is advertised as being offered for sale or lease or has been sold or lease. 
This means that the new owner, that would be the buyer or the tenant, must also consent if after the transaction closes, the property is being advertised as having been sold or leased. At this point, that would be after the ownership changes, the new owner will be the owner under RESA who must provide their consent if a registrant or brokerage advertises that the property has been sold or leased. Advertising also cannot show or name any non-licensed individual. And brokerages are responsible for reviewing and approving all registrant advertising to ensure that they comply with the requirements under RESA. And if a registrant is providing services through a personal real estate corporation, a statement setting out the name of the personal real estate corporation must be inserted in every advertisement where the registrant's name appears. Number 11, service agreements. This is one of the areas that will affect the most change in how you provide your real estate services. As of January 1, 2022, all brokerages must enter into a written service agreement with every person that they provide real estate services to before the services are provided. Please refer to page 70 of the handbook, which sets out the service agreement requirements in section 25 of RESA and section 1.6 of the regulation. These requirements apply to any real estate services provided to any seller, to any buyer, to any landlord, to any tenant, whether the properties are residential, commercial, agricultural, industrial, or any other property, including vacant land. Registrants must not provide any real estate services to a person without first entering into a written service agreement with them. Real estate services are described on page 65 of the handbook. Please turn to them, refer to them. Trading services, property management services, private sales services are all real estate services. Trading services mean these. Number one, finding real estate for a person. Number two, finding another person to engage in a trade of real estate. Number three, showing or making representations about the real estate, which would involve advertising. Number four, advising someone on the appropriate price for real estate. Fifthly, negotiating the price or other terms of trade in real estate on behalf of someone. Presenting offers to purchase or offers to sell, to sell or offers to lease respecting a trade in real estate. Or receiving deposit monies paid in respective real estate. The regulation prescribes, in addition to categorizing these, uh, RESA categorizing these uh, services, the registration prescribes specific content requirements for your service agreements. The requirements under the regulation for every service agreement are, and there's five of them, number one, the identification of the parties, number two, the description of the services to be provided, and this is where registrants are going to have to pause and consider what services their brokerage is going to be providing to their prospective clients and set them out in writing in the service agreement. Number three, the date of the commencement and the date of the expiry of the service agreement. Fourthly, if there are any early termination rights, they have to be set out in the service agreement. And then fifthly, the terms of payment or compensation to the brokerage, if any. So the criteria for what needs to be included in a service agreement is very basic and brokerages will need to give some thought and consideration as to how they should draft and present their service agreements to the prospective clients and customers that uh, they intend to provide real estate services to. Any amendment required to a service agreement, such as when services are added to the list or removed from the list, or when other terms are added or removed or 
When an extension is required and is agreed to, these must also all be put in writing and signed on behalf of the brokerage and, on behalf, and by the person who the services are being provided to. Service agreements are between brokerages and the person receiving the services. Individual registrants are not a party to any service agreement. Individual registrants may only enter into service agreements on behalf of their brokerage. And lastly, number 12, record keeping, brokerage and registrant requirements. Under RISA and the regulation, all registrants are required to make and maintain records that are necessary to accurately demonstrate their business activities, their financial affairs and client transactions. To adequately demonstrate they are in compliance with RISA and the regulation. And all registrants must maintain records of any correspondence with clients. This includes all email, all text messaging, other exchanges. And such correspondence must be maintained in a retrievable manner by every registrant for a period of at least five years. This is a new requirement for every registrant. Salespeople are required to promptly provide a copy of each service agreement to their client without delay after it's signed or any amendment to it after it's signed and then provide a copy to their brokerage. And as with every offer to purchase or lease, brokerages must keep a copy of every service agreement for at least five years. In conclusion, as RISA and the regulation come into force and are put into practice by you as a registrant in the real estate industry, there will be many questions about how the new changes will affect you. You can send your questions to risa at mrea.mb.ca. Please keep in mind that for the most part, RISA and the regulation is a carryover from the former regime. And there are some new features, like incorporating a personal real estate corporation. It's now an option. Improved professional standards are important and they benefit everyone. Written service agreements are intended to provide clarity as to what real estate services a person can expect to receive from a registrant on behalf of their brokerage. And this should be seen as beneficial for everyone, brokerages, salespersons, and clients that they serve. So on behalf of the Manitoba Real Estate Association and the Manitoba Securities Commission, thank you for listening.